part of each is a core of females who raise the cubs. Each pride inherits a 50 square mile territory passed down through the lionesses. In this social network, the males have but two jobs, to procreate and protect. The restful ease we associate with predators has two causes. This is a sensible way to get through the heat of the day. Hunting is for the cool of the evening. Daylight is the time for walking the boundaries of the pride's territory, marking its margins and daring rogue outsiders to enter. This is what it means to be territorial. Each pride stays home and waits for the great wildebeest herd to come in range. This is their country. Out of the mists of the past, a prehistoric relic with an uncertain future. Still, the lion gives them a wide berth. This is the black rhino. It was the Greeks 2,500 years ago who gave this creature its name. Rhino means nose, and what a nose it is. Unfortunately, that nose has caused the decline of this once numerous beast. The black rhino has been hunted to near extinction. Only a few thousand survive on the whole planet. The rhino is not really black at all, but dusky. It's the rain that enamels them into their metallic and invincible black. They really have no predators. Though desperate hyenas are known to attack infant rhinos, usually at their peril. They seem so placid and self-contained, though they can be unpredictable and horrific. But plainly, that is their nature. It's why they have no predators. It's their stern presence that forestalls attack. This is the man of war of the Serengeti. Lake Magadi. This is what the dry season looks like. Life is hard, and only the hardy resident creatures remain. The pantry is nearly bare. It's been a month since the last rain, and with daily temperatures over 100 degrees, water seems only a distant myth. But not for elephants, creatures who seem to thrive off their memories. They can find long lost water, sometimes buried deep below the surface in waterlogged sand. Part of their success has to do with their being able to smell water with their great sensitive trunks. But it has to be said that their memories help them sniff in all the right places. The elephant's trunk is one of the great creations of nature. Some 40,000 muscles help it to do the heavy work, as well as allow it to pick up an egg without mishap. But its greatest feat of sensitivity may be in simply locating water. Elephants have a great thirst, 40 to 50 gallons a day. They must find it or die. This rogue male, its single tusk, a tribute to a lifetime of struggle and strife, has found all the water he'll need for a while. For now, though, he must leave it to find food. The hundreds of pounds of grasses and shrubs his body needs each day. He'll be back.
It's a parched world. But they've been through all this before, ever since the dawn of time. It's always a matter of pressing on. Hard times are not without some benefit. Hardship pressures the herd, prompting them to cope, to learn from this demanding season. Now, not all of them will survive, but those who do will constitute a more enduring and fitter species. Masai Mara, Kenya. This may be the most demanding part of the thousand mile great migration. At every step of the way, there are eyes watching the wildebeests with empty stomachs and with evil intent. In a very real way, the herd itself is like one vast fluid creature. These are animals made to prosper in a habitat without confinement, where the natural ebb and flow of migrating life provides all they will ever need. The great migration is about to happen once again, drawn by the promise of sweet water and green pastures. Zebra live in small family herds, one stallion and several females and their offspring. And they too travel with the wildebeest. There really is safety in numbers. Impala are the most graceful of the antelopes. Under attack, they bounce away in sharp zigzag patterns with amazing hang time, confusing their predators. Buffalo don't need to be either clever or athletic. They're one-ton bruisers. Lions need their protein, but it can be a costly meal. The Oribi is a member of the antelope family. It's the animated eyes that gave these timid creatures their name. Again, the ancient Greeks said it best. Antel, bright, and optos, eyes. Antelopes, bright eyes. Gazelles, on the other hand, were named by the Arabs rather than the Greeks. Gajils, they called them. But the meaning was still the same. Bright eyes. This is the Thompson's gazelle, Tommy for short. Like all the members of the antelope family, Tommies depend on quick twitch muscle response to escape from predators. Living in small herds, someone is always watching, always alert. Grant's gazelle is a bit larger than a Tommy. Its distinctive white tail pattern is confusing to pursuers. They can't pick out individuals. Among the largest members of the antelope family are the curious heart of beasts with their long, stunned expressions. The massive eland, the biggest antelope with its three-foot horns. Despite its size, when startled, it can jump over six feet in the air. Its tusks are scimitar sharp, and predators prefer to attack them from the rear as they are fleeing. Head on, they're nothing but trouble. A tommy up a tree, brought here by the leopard that caught and killed it. 
The rule in the Serengeti is that lesser predators have to hide their winnings from the opportunistic lions, who would rather steal than hunt. Up a tree, you're safe from lions, usually. Evolution has driven the giraffe to great lengths to allow it to browse the top of the acacia trees. Altitude is its environmental niche, a place where others can't graze. But it's not only height that giraffes have been blessed with, but prehensile lips and a tongue suited to grazing just the choicest green bits. And it's not just better access to food that height gives the giraffe, it's power too. Those long legs pack a nasty wallop. A mortifying blow to any big cat that might want to take a shot at all that giraffe protein. Play is the heart and soul of learning for all animal young, including humans. Seeing a mother and calf reminds us that the Serengeti is about nurturing, not just about predation and blood. Most animals here are vegetarians. Still, even for the carnivores, life is mainly about parents protecting and teaching the next generation. Could they be more like us, really? The eyes are the windows to the soul. And when they peer at us, what is it they see? It's a tribute to conservation in Africa that we can still witness this spectacle. Two million wildebeest moving as one. The Great Plains of North America must have looked like this when several million buffalo once ranged across them, from Texas to Canada, Iowa to Colorado. Those great herds, just like this, were a movable feast, plowing up and invigorating the earth with their hooves, fertilizing as they moved along, stirring up flights of insects for the birds. In America, senseless slaughter and greed ended all that, but not here, where the vast herd still winds its way as slowly and deliberately as ever. This is the Super Bowl of animal travel, the last great migration. Even in the midst of all this potential food, there are other demands on a male lion. Providing for the next generation of lions, a duty which seems like a privilege, can become difficult. That's because females in estrus must copulate every 25 minutes over three days. What the act lacks in vigor, it makes up in frequency. Well, possibly. It's a demanding and sometimes humiliating life for the king of beasts. It's also a long-term commitment. For every cub born, the father's presence will be required for two years until his offspring can survive on their own. Even so, 80% of cubs don't make it through their first year. Meanwhile, the herd awaits the next attack. But there's little to fear from this pair today.
For now, however, the Serengeti's becoming an empty landscape. You can almost taste the desperation. Predators, like lions, have fairly helpless and immobile young, which prevents them migrating to follow the feast. The survival odds are so slim for any of these cubs. Every day is a test of wills. Who will eat and who will not? Starvation, a lack of meat, is the foremost killer of the young. So that what appears romantically as an Eden before the fall is no peaceable kingdom at all. Which is why lions live communally. Living in groups and raising all the young together is an efficient way of ensuring the future. It also allows cooperative hunting, driving the herd into the waiting jaws of other pride females. They look so motherly here, but it's the females who do the lion's share of the hunting. From tender grooming to horrific violence in the blink of an eye. The wildebeest have not had a deep drink for days. Even now, the edges of the herd are being dogged by predators. The young and the old and the weak are especially vulnerable at this stage. This carcass was downed by wild dogs. But a lion has sauntered in to claim the feast. It's what we mean by the lion share. It means everything. Lions don't share. It all looks so gritty and doomed. They must get to water. But as a species, the wildebeest have been through this countless times. The point is to keep moving, to keep living. There is a goal in sight. And this is it, the life-giving ribbon of the Mara River. The Serengeti is a Maasai word that simply means the wide place. But fortunately, it's a wide place that's split by the waters of the Mara. It always flows with a bounty of cool water, making its confident way toward Lake Victoria. These waters are a vast magnet. Sooner or later, everyone shows up. Zebra is a Swahili word that means striped donkey. The river is also the haunt of one massive creature that appears almost comical. It's the huge three-ton hippo with thick skin, cruel teeth and jaws, and the curious ability to urinate backwards. Retro urination, it's called, and it may be related to some evolutionary necessity for spreading its scent only behind it. They're not the most flexible of creatures. They have ears that can close when they submerge. They even copulate and give birth underwater. They can stay under for six minutes. According to African folklore, when God created all the animals, he asked the hippos where they'd like to live. In the cool rivers, said the hippos. But you'll eat all the fish, God replied. Then we promise to eat no fish. And they've kept their word. They're vegetarians. 
Hippos mostly spend their day submerged to avoid sunburn. But in the evening and at night, they come ashore to feed on hundreds of pounds of grasses. They're exclusively herbivores, though they are dangerous to man. More people are killed by hippos each year than by lions or crocs. The tragedy usually happens in the evening when people run into them in the tall riverside grasses. Lions rarely attack hippos, though they have been known to make off with a very young one. But lions have to be desperately hungry to attempt this meal. It can be costly. In the end, it's the consistent flow of the Mara River that makes hippo life possible. Not just because of its depths, but because it fosters lush grasses along its length. If this river ever failed, so would the hippos. The region is dotted with forested areas, woods that are associated with the availability of water. Where water is scarce, grasses always outcompete the trees and the land reverts to grassland, but not here. Water also creates vast wallows for the water buffalo. With water and plentiful grass, a buffalo can graze unconcerned. It fears nothing. The water buck has little to fear as well. It has powerful musk glands whose smell actually repels crocs. So when it's pursued by lions, it heads for water. Crocs will have nothing to do with it. The forests were designed with monkeys in mind. Baboons live in troops to raise and teach their young, to cooperate in finding food, and to defend themselves. With their sharp teeth, they've been known to take infant leopards or cheetahs. Seeing these savanna monkeys, it's hard not to imagine our ancestors developing from the wide range of monkey life here. It's the sharing of food in return for grooming, the group affiliation and affection that are so compelling. It's the water seeps that are so attractive. They promise refreshing drinks and perpetually green shoots. They also promise predators. For where there is water, there is meat. Trouble is, we too often concentrate on the stellar creatures, the lions and elephants, and neglect the lesser ones the saddle-billed stork, the white pelican, the ibis, whose curved bill the Egyptians considered God's pen. A guinea fowl is not much of a meal. Still, it is known for uttering a harsh warning cry when a hungry cat is about. The Cory Bustard will often stroll with the great beasts scarfing up insects disturbed in their wake. It's a similar strategy to that used by the crown to crane. The ostrich responds to heat by fluffing its luxuriant feathers. A fluffed ostrich is its own umbrella. The slightest breeze through its feathers 
carries off masses of heat. Circling vultures are a signal throughout the Serengeti. It means a meal is just below. In this case, it's a pack of jackals on a wildebeest. They're constantly on guard for approaching scavengers. Because they can cover vast distances daily and because they have telescopic eyesight, vultures are able to survive on scavenging alone. They never need to hunt and manage to live off table scraps. They're also fearless and casually land within a few feet of predators who could easily tear them to pieces. Fortunately, they're too busy eating. As more and more vultures gather, the carcass is reduced to the point where there are only a few jackal bites left. This is what the surgical implement of the vulture's ripping beak was designed for. This looks like chaos, but in the crowd of vultures, Darwin's survival of the fittest is at play. Those without the stamina or the bravado to get a bite or two don't deserve to survive and reproduce. It's evolution at its most sensible. It's September and time for the great herd to turn south again in search of green grass, recrossing the Great Mara River in force. But the river's deceptive and hides many dangers. For days on end, the herd comes to the edge, waiting for just the right moment to cross. Plainly, the time is not right. There are too many jaws waiting. In fact, it's not so much a crossing as a sacrifice. Here, the great herd will do for the massive crocs what it has always done for the lions of the Serengeti. It's around water that the herd is most vulnerable. The wildebeests are all concentrated at the crossing point. Still, sooner or later, they must overcome their dread. For now, the herd seems settled on another tack. They'll cross much farther downstream at a point they feel more comfortable with. They've seen it all before. They know what to do. This is animal intelligence. Anyway, if it gets too hot, there's many an obliging tree. Shade can be as valuable a commodity as water. Blessing of water will transform the land and hasten the herds on their way. It's a reminder of the green shoots that await them in the south. Though they are stressed, getting weak and losing weight, their only hope is to make it to the next crossing of the Mara 
where the water is not too swift, where the banks are not too steep, and where there are none or few crocs. Still, at that crossing, wherever it is, they'll have to go. Caution will have to be sacrificed. Some individuals will be lost, but the herd will survive. This is no walk in the park. It's serious. It's all one vast organism, the herd, predators, and the land. They all score off and depend on one another. It's a constant miracle how it all works out. And this is the scene of tomorrow's miracle, a baptism of fire. In the cool of the morning, while you can still see the lion's breath, a zebra feast is underway. This hunt took place at night, and the carcass is halfway gone by sunup. The lions were waiting by the Mara for the wildebeests and came up trumps with a zebra who unluckily arrived well before the great herd. Lionesses almost certainly caught this meal, but a pride male has appropriated it to himself. Luckily, there's more here than he can stomach, or he'd chase away all the females. There's plenty to share with the mothers and groomers of his cubs. But no one else is getting in on the windfall, least of all a black jackal. The big cats are exclusively meat eaters, and meat takes longer to digest and makes them feel slow, leaden, and tired. From the point of view of the herd, however, it's fortunate. A full lion will not be inclined to hunt for days. For now, there's only one predator that the herd has to fear, the mara. It's a great and unpredictable serpent, barring their way to the future. Today's watery passage is something to contemplate and consider very carefully. It's completely unnatural for the wildebeest to swim it. It's a killer. But somehow they know it's a passage they must make. hour after dawn, the first few pathfinders come to the river's edge to review the situation. You can almost feel a groundswell of anticipation and eagerness to get the ordeal over with. But no one's going anywhere until the pathfinders choose the perfect spot and the perfect time. The herd doesn't live by consensus. It follows, without question, its leaders. This isn't blandness. It's behavior forged on the anvil of experience and evolution. And it's the only thing that works. Finally, at 8.30 sharp, 
a pathfinder takes the plunge. There's no telling what currents or crocs await his bold move. And then they all go suddenly, using the same spot to enter the fast flowing Mara. There's so much pent up demand to get to the other side. It's almost comically single file, as if discipline were the first thing on their minds. But what is really happening here is fear. It's as if the river is a great predator, and their bodies and brains are reacting the same way that they must do when they're being singled out by the lions. They're running for their lives. The herd is in the grip of their own adrenaline. It's flight and fight. You can see it in their eyes. Much more of this and their hearts would explode. Still, like all trials that are tough, even for humans, this one, too, has its benefits. Wildebeest were created for this crossing. They're powerful swimmers, but the current is strong. The exertion and the stress exhausts and drowns some. Others, particularly the young and inexperienced, get confused by the noise and violence of the crossing. The old ones, too, are at risk. You can only survive this so many times. Actually, it's not so much getting into the water that's the problem. It's getting out where everything begins to go pear-shaped. The single column of beasts has grown to several across, all trying desperately to get up the slick bank. Their hooves and horns are as dangerous to their own kind as the teeth of the lions and crocs are. At this stage, all discipline is lost. The young and the restless hurl themselves headlong into the foam. Suddenly, their body chemistry has turned these docile and placid creatures into animal athletes capable of jumping 20 feet. On the other side, all is chaos. The fiercest of injuries can occur at this point. Injuries that the lions are only too willing to take advantage of. 
The irony is that wildebeest kill and injure more of their own kind on the far banks of the Mara than are ever dreamt of by the crocs and lions. But this too is a sort of evolutionary weeding out of the herd. It's every creature for himself, never mind the herd, as they fight the downstream pull of the water and the deadly kicks of their relatives and siblings. Certain points along the bank are destined to become boneyards. No one is escaping from here unless he or she tramples on the body of someone else. It's pathetic, but this is the way it's meant to be. Sometimes a disoriented calf will return to the wrong bank looking for its mother. But to attempt the crossing twice is a death sentence. Mothers have been known to do the same seeking their calves. It usually ends up very bad. For the crocs, it's all an embarrassment of riches. They'll eat very well for some time. A solitary marabou stork supervises a pileup of wildebeest carcasses. This eddy in the river will be a fine source of protein for a great many creatures for days to come. Crocs from far down river have followed the scent of death in the stream flow. Now is their time of plenty. There are hundreds of wildebeest bodies in the river, but they will all be clean and disarticulated skeletons in a few days. Sometimes we find vast collections of dinosaur bones in similar conglomerations like this, and we wonder how they came to be. This is how. Come to the banks of the Mara and you can see a recreation of life in the deep past. This is the way of life, not death. To everything, there is a season. As the long day wanes, the Mara River flows calmly on as if nothing has happened. <laughs> 